Hi, I'm Dr. Ward with Regions EMS. In this video, we'll be reviewing Guideline 33, Obstetrical Emergencies. This guideline primarily addresses the treatment of eclampsia, but also covers hypovolemic, likely hemorrhagic, shock in the pregnant patient. This guideline begins by including any patient with known or suspected pregnancy. This includes a woman who has missed her period. In any patient that is known to be pregnant or in which pregnancy is suspected, but who is not in active labor, consider placing the patient in the left lateral recumbent position. This maneuver displaces the fetus off the inferior vena cava, which can be compressed, leading to hypotension. This is most important in the later stages of pregnancy. Next, obtain IV access. If your patient is greater than 20 weeks gestation and has complaints of severe headache, vision changes, right upper quadrant pain, or is hypertensive, which is defined as a blood pressure of greater than 140 over 90, or an increase in pre-pregnancy baseline blood pressure by a systolic pressure of 30 or a diastolic of 20. This patient is considered preeclamptic and needs to be evaluated and treated in the emergency department. The primary emergent risk to persons with preeclampsia is the risk of progressing to eclampsia, which is the development of seizures in the context of a pregnant patient greater than 20 weeks pregnancy with signs of preeclampsia and the development of seizure. Note that if a patient is pregnant and has no history of seizure, any seizure activity is presumed to be eclampsia. If you arrive and find the patient seizing, you first, your first therapy should be IM midazolam or lorazepam, then followed by the more definitive treatment of magnesium. If the patient had a seizure which is stopped, and shows signs of eclampsia, then you should also treat with magnesium sulfate. And our protocol addresses that with four grams IV or IO diluted in 10 milliliters of normal saline, given over two to three minutes. If IV or IO access is unobtainable, then you can give 10, mil or 10 grams IM split between two doses, five grams in each gluteal muscle. If your patient instead has vaginal bleeding or abdominal pain, and is hypotensive, again, place, consider placing your patient in the left lateral recumbent position to displace the uterus off the inferior vena cava and obtain IV access. Try to have the patient quantify bleeding by number of pads per hour used. Treatment for this patient should begin with IV fluids, one to two liters, to maintain a blood pressure greater than or equal to 90, and transport uh, should be prioritized for this patient who could have any, anything from a ruptured ectopic pregnancy to a placental abnormality leading to severe hemorrhage with or without pain or another condition unrelated to the pregnancy. So to recap, a woman who is greater than 20 weeks pregnant who has a seizure should be treated with magnesium but also can be treated with a benzodiazepine uh, first such as midazolam or lorazepam if actively seizing for you. If your patient is abdominal pain or severe bleeding, treat with normal saline to maintain a blood pressure systolic greater than or equal to 90 and transport to the hospital for further evaluation and treatment. Next on guideline 34, childbirth and labor. Although this is a rare and therefore st stress-provoking call for many providers, the most important thing to remember when faced with a patient in active labor uh, active and imminent labor is that the vast majority of births require no significant intervention on your part. Women have been delivering babies without medical assistance for millennia and usually do so greatly on their own without any assistance. Your job is to coach and catch. Also keep in mind that if your patient delivers in the field, you will now have two patients to care for. You may want to consider additional resources uh, early. When you meet your patient, first priority is to determine if the patient is in active labor and if the baby is ready to deliver now. Obtain a pre preliminary history, including how far along the pregnancy is, their due date, as well as symptoms, including contractions, rupture of membranes, and any bleeding. Next, a visual inspection of the perineum should be performed if symptoms indicate active labor. Your goal is to identify if the head is crowning. If no crowning is present, then you can just monitor contraction frequency and duration and transport to the hospital. Keep in, in mind that delivery may progress and you may need to recheck for crowning as the delivery will progress over time. If the patient is less than 36 weeks gestation or there's a complication such as abnormal presentation of the infant, severe vaginal bleeding, multiple gestations, 
or unfavorable maternal anatomy, suggesting that the natural birth will be impossible or very difficult, expedite your transport to a high-risk OB facility. You should still prepare for delivery if the infant is crowning, but ideally this patient should not deliver on scene due to high risk of complications. If your patient is past 36 weeks gestation and is crowning, you must prepare for delivery. Remember, at most times, the woman does all the work here. You are there to catch, clamp the cord, dry the newborn, and that will be the extent of your care. After delivery, Massaging the uterus, the lower abdomen, will promote uterine contraction and help to control postpartum hemorrhage. Some perineal bleeding is normal, but large quantities of blood or free bleeding is abnormal and can be dangerous. If bleeding is seen to be excessive, expedite transport. If you encounter shoulder dystocia, which is when the shoulder gets stuck coming out, attempt to elevate the hips and have the mother bring her knees up to her chest. This knee-chest position may help facilitate delivery of a shoulder which is caught on the pelvis. If the umbilical cord is prolapsed coming out first, you must remove pressure off the cord to keep blood flow to the baby. To do this, insert your gloved fingers, use a sterile glove if you have one, into the vagina to relieve any pressure on the cord and apply a saline-soaked gauze dressing over the exposed cord. If the umbilical cord is wrapped around the neck, attempt to flip the cord off the neck. Remember, it may be wrapped around multiple times. If you find yourself in the position, expedite transport to the hospital for assistance. If you encounter a breech birth, normal delivery is often extremely difficult, if not impossible, and transport to an appropriate hospital is necessary. Delivery on, of the child on scene only is uh, recommended if inevitable. You should encourage the mother to refrain from pushing and support any presenting parts with your hand. Do not attempt to pull any presenting parts to help the child deliver. And again, expedite transport to the hospital for assistance. If you are unable to deliver an infant, your best choice of action is to create an air passage by supporting the presenting part. You can do this by placing two fingers, again ideally with a sterile glove, alongside the nose and face and gently maintain an air space. You can then transport the mother in the left lateral position or in knee chest position with your hands providing a, a space for the oxygen to reach the infant. In summary, if the mother is at least 36 weeks gestation and is crowning, you must prepare for a delivery on scene and prepare to care for the child once born. If the mother is less than 36 weeks and showing signs of labor, an expedited transport to a high risk OB facility is recommended. If there's any abnormal presentation or a complication with the delivery, such as pro prolapsed cord, shoulder dystocia, or breech birth, support the present presenting part as best as possible and expedite transport to the nearest hospital. Finally, let's review guideline 35, care of the newborn child. For this guideline, we will review care of the newborn infant. Remember, most deliveries are normal and uncomplicated. Similarly, most newborns require minimal care. If you have a term gestation infant who is breathing or crying, dry and warm the child. Double clamp the cord and cut between your clamps. After drying and wrapping the infant in a clean, dry blanket, note the APGAR scores and the infant can be given to the mother to hold, assuming the child has good color, muscle tone, and is breathing adequately on their own at this time. Of note, routine airway suctioning of the newborn is no longer recommended. You should suction clear apneotic fluid from the airway only when there is an airway obstruction or if you will be needing to use the bag valve mask for assisted ventilation. If meconium is present, deep suctioning may still be required if no response to initial resuscitation efforts of the non-vigorous newborn. If the infant is born and is not spontaneously breathing or crying and it does not have good muscle tone, treatment begins with the same process, warm, dry, and provide some stimulation such as flicking the foot with your finger. Clear the airway if necessary. At this point, assess heart rate and breathing. If the heart rate is less than 100 or there's inadequate breathing, your first priority is to provide ventilations with a bag valve mask. Provide one ventilation every two seconds and attach pulse oximetry and cardiac monitor. If your heart rate increases to greater than 100, 
and the infant begins spontaneously breathing, continue to provide supplemental oxygen as needed with a goal oxygen saturation of 94%. Keep the infant warm and dry and continue to monitor and reassess. However, if the heart rate remains less than 100, ventilations be continue to be your priority with the bag valve mask. You may need to attempt to change position, uh, repositioning the airway or the bag valve mask technique to improve your ventilation. If at any time the heart rate drops below 60, begin chest compressions, continuing ventilations while you do so. Obtain vascular access, in this case IO is your route of choice, and administer epinephrine. Your normal cardiac arrest epinephrine is the drug of choice, the 1 to 10,000 dose, but your dose will be 0.01 milligrams per kilogram. An important note here is what is the weight of the newborn child. It is important as a general rule to realize that the average full-term newborn weighs about 3 kilograms. So the dose of epinephrine in the newborn resuscitation is going to be 0.3 milliliters of your normal cardiac arrest 1 to 10,000 solution. You can also give a bolus of normal saline volume of 10 milliliters per kilogram, kilogram which would be about 30 cc's for the average full-term newborn. Remember, most newborns requiring resuscitation will respond to ventilations with a bag valve mask. Few will require compressions and or epinephrine. If you're not getting a response to these interventions, consider other complications such as hypovolemia, as the infants can sometimes lose blood to the placenta, especially if elevated above the mother prior to clamping the umbilical cord. Consider hypoglycemia, as well as pneumothorax, which can happen with trauma during the birth process. Hypoglycemia can be treated with 5 ml of D10. Remember, you can make D10 by diluting 1 ml of the D50 that you normally use with 4 milliliters of normal saline and administer the entire 5 milliliters. A few clinical pearls to remember. The key vital signs of a newborn are respiratory rate and effort, as well as heart rate. Pulse oximetry is helpful, but normal values immediately after birth are lower than normal. At five minutes, a normal oxygen saturation is anything greater than 80%. It should be greater than 85% by 10 minutes, but is often higher. Also, pulse oximetry should be checked on the right side of the body due to the possibility of congenital heart diseases, which may alter the reading on the left side. Again, remember that most infants need only minimal intervention on your part. Dry, warm, and minimal stimulation is all they will need to have your happy healthy infant.